this entitled lady is demanding to upgrade her flight seat for free. When she is told no, she refuses to move until they upgrade her. But this clever flight attendant has a plan to completely ruin her day and her flight plans. Happy birthday, today's your birthday, on with the revamp show. About 10 years ago, I was working as a software deployment engineer for the UK branch of a Brazilian company, owner by a US company. There were three of us for the entire world, all based in the UK. Our roles comprised of flying somewhere on or for a Monday, building configuration and labs in the local US company office, training their staff, updating code if things didn't work, etc., before deploying their first site for them while they watched. They would do the second while you shadowed, and then they'd do the third with you at the hotel but on call. A typical country engagement was three to six months because you'd be bouncing between anywhere between four countries at a time, each week at a different one. Enter new HR manager for Europe. Each week we would blast a timesheet to UK HR to allow them to send it to Brazil who would build a US company. Quickly, the new HR manager notices that each of us is clocking in around 30 hours of OT a week. Simply because the contract stated, the moment we left our houses on a Monday or Sunday, that we were now classed as working because of the international travel. We enjoyed this clause because time and a half for 30 hours a week was lovely. But that did mean that the further from the UK we went, the quicker we hit the UK limit of our 40 hours per week. My record was hitting 40 hours by lunchtime Tuesday due to spending 27 hours flying to Sydney. As I said, the HR manager didn't like that we were going so far over the 40 hour limit in both our contracts and in the UK. I sat down with her and explained that it is just the nature of the job, that we didn't mind because we got overtime for it. She wasn't happy. Talking about process and they wouldn't be paying OT for hours over from X date. Throughout the meeting, she was abrasive and rude, like she was talking to a child. Not the highest build technical resource in the company. Naturally, quite annoyed by this, but very little we could do. The OT wasn't in our contracts as we were salaried employees and it was a perk that we were given. I grabbed the other two in a quick huddle and we formulated a plan. We brief our respective project managers, employee of the US company, and they each agree. The next Monday, A flew to Finland, B flew to Austria, and I flew to Kazakhstan. Naturally, I hit the 40 hour cap quickest and at mid-morning Wednesday, with only half of the urgent work completed for the week, I tell the PM I'll pick him and our file maintenance resource when they want before jumping in the car and heading back to the hotel. I text A and B and let them know we are a go. Later on that day, A does the same. All the while this has been escalated both via my PM and the local company MD back to the US head office and this back to my Brazil head office and down to our UK office. By Thursday morning my time I get an email saying they won't pay overtime but will give time off in lieu. Quick text-based huddle and the other two are happy with that. I'd prefer the overtime, but if I get an additional two days of paid holiday a week to my holiday balance, then I'll take it. We agree, go back to working. HR manager is suitably browbeaten for her mistake, and then even more so when she realizes that time off in lieu has to be taken in a month cycle, meaning each of us had around a week off paid per month. This one happened a few months ago at the airport in Madrid, Spain. I witnessed it, but I'm not directly involved with this. I was sitting near a gate, well in advance for my flight. The previous flight to use the gate was still boarding its last passengers. It was a pretty short one to Lisbon, so probably less than an hour flight time. In comes textbook Karen with her suitcase, going straight to the counter and without any form of politeness, starts complaining to one of the two gate agents. The conversation was more or less, I know you have a free seat in first. The airline publishes seat maps online. I'm a loyal member of your airline. Can you upgrade me? She slams a card on the counter. I am sorry, but I cannot randomly upgrade people. Plus you have an economy basic ticket. Even if I could, we would upgrade any standard economy passenger before you. Finally, this is a silver card. While we do have gold and platinum members on this flight that we could also upgrade first. You have to note that European airlines typically do not automatically upgrade passengers as in the US. Also, the difference between first and economy is usually not that much. Seats are the same, but in front of the plane with a blocked middle seat and slightly better food. That's it. They have already boarded. If you don't upgrade me, then I won't use this airline ever again. Gate Agent 2 makes an announcement about the final call for passengers that Karen ignores completely. Ma'am, I repeat that I don't have the power to upgrade anybody per airline policy. 
it would not be fair to those who actually paid for the ticket. The seat is free, I'm sure you can make an exception. Once again, I cannot, but I would recommend you to board. So will you upgrade me, right? Agent now annoyed. For the third time, this is not something I can do. You are the last passenger we are waiting for. Can you please go to the gate? I will not move from this counter until you upgrade me. You should really... Unless you're telling me I'm upgraded, I don't want to hear about it. All right. Passes like one or two minutes. So have you made up your mind and have me upgraded? Actually, ma'am, the gate is closed. We are not accepting late passengers anymore. I would suggest you go to the customer service desk to rebook. What? I've been here for like 10 minutes. Yes, but you refused twice to board the plane and made it clear that you would not move from this desk until I upgraded you, which I told you five times I cannot do. We couldn't delay the plane because of you. But you should have told me. I'm sorry, but you made it clear that you didn't want to hear about it if it was not about your upgrade, which, once again, I cannot do. At this moment, Karen left with a defeated and infuriated look. It was pretty fun to watch, I have to say. I have no idea whether Karen could be rebooked for free, but I hope not. Oh, I bet she thought she was so smart. How can I get a first class seat for free? Buy economy, wait till right near the end, see if any of them are free and just demand to be upgraded. What could go wrong? You could miss your flight, that could go wrong. There's no harm in asking for an upgrade, but if they're not gonna give it to you and it's the last call to board the plane, maybe it's time to give up and just board the plane. The background. I got divorced a few years ago, and not long after, my ex moved to a different country. We still had a joint account. I know it should have been cancelled, but it was overlooked. And the only transaction still happening on it was for a home alarm. We were three years on a five-year contract, and the fee was approximately $75 a month. The joint account also had a $1,000 overdraft. I started preparing to sell my home and called the alarm company to see about cancelling my account. If you have tried to cancel an alarm contract, you know how impossible they make it and how much of a jerk they can be. Anyway, me is me and AC is alarm company. I'm selling my home and would like to cancel my alarm. Can you give me the username and password? I give the username and password. I'm sorry, but that's not correct. I have the contract in front of me and that is what it says on the contract. Sorry, but that is not correct. It must have been changed. Okay, let's change it. Sorry, sir. You are not the account holder and you need the account holder to change the password to authorize any changes to the account. Looks closer at the contract. The ex signed it. It looks like my ex signed the contract, but we are divorced and she's moved out of the country. I'm sorry, sir, but without her authorization, we cannot make any changes to the account. Things are not amicable between us and she will not call you to make any changes. I'm sorry, sir, but we cannot help you. I would really like to get this taken care of. Sorry, but we cannot help without the account holder's authorization. I can't get that. Then there's nothing we can do. You need to send someone to collect your alarm and various sensors. Then I will no longer be paying the bill. Sir, that's not the way this works. You are contractually obligated for the full term of the contract and then the equipment is yours to keep. I will no longer be paying the bill. In that case, I'll send this to collections and ruin your credit score. Hmm, I'm pretty sure you said that I'm not the account holder. And according to the contract I have in front of me, the contract is between you and my ex. So I am done paying her bill. Sir, you cannot do that. That's not ethical. You have told me that according to your rules, you can't work with me. So I am just going to follow your rules. The next day I head into my bank and try to cancel the direct debit transaction. I'm informed that I can't cancel it. Only the originator of the direct debit can cancel it. And with the originator being the alarm company, that is not likely. I live in Canada and those are the rules, at least according to my bank. They tell me I can manually cancel a transaction, but that I have to come into the branch to do it. And I have to do it every month. For three months I do this, but it's a real pain as I work 45 minutes out of town and my workday happens to be the same as bank hours. So a special trip is needed and time off work to do this. After three months, I went back to the bank and asked if there's any way to sort this out. I explained the situation with the alarm company and how they won't work with me as I'm not the account holder and how I can't get the account holder to participate. They empathize, but sorry, we can't help. Me is me and BK is the bank. I would like to close the account then. Sorry, it requires both signatures to close the account to the way it was set up. I can't get the other signature. We won't be able to close the account then. I've been transferring money each month to cover this alarm fee and I won't be doing that anymore so we need to close this account so it does not incur overdraft fees and charges. 
But we can't close the account or stop the direct debit. Can I take myself off the account? Yes, you can remove yourself from the account. Okay, let's do that. The bank removes me from the account. Do I have any liability on this account anymore? Nope, you're no longer an account holder. You do realize that by me no longer transferring money into this account, the alarm fee will keep coming out each month and running the overdraft up. That's okay, we will deal with it. 10 months later, I get a call from the bank. My number was still listed as the contact number. Sir, you have overdrawn your account to the tune of $1,300 and change due to the fees, overdraft charges and interest. I ask who the account holder is. They name my ex. I say then that this isn't my problem. The response is, you were an account holder on this account. I describe the entire problem and they respond with, you need to pay this. I am sorry, I say. I tried everything to reconcile this with my branch and they did not want to work with me. And as I'm not the account holder, it is no longer my problem. The bank then responded, well, who's going to pay for this overdraft balance? I responded with, you will need to talk to the account holder. The bank responds with, sir, that is not very ethical. You told me your ex is no longer in the country. My response before I hung up was, I tried to work with you, but your rules would not allow it. So I am simply following your rules. Sometimes all the rules and regulations for these things is so ridiculous. Everything feels so robotic and formulated that if you're an outlier, there's no custom support or help for you. And all of this problem just because he didn't have the password. I work at a service station, petrol station, in Australia. We are a fairly small store but are right between two very wealthy neighborhoods. As such, we have a lot of rich folk coming in and paying in $100 bills or just asking for them to be changed. We also have a strict only $200 in the till at any given time rule to prevent theft. This of course causes issues. Example, a guy comes in and pays a $100 bill for a coffee and suddenly we have no change left for other customers. They've tried to combat this by saying that they only get change if you buy something, but people will just buy gum to get change. To make matters worse, we cannot drop coins into the safe. This is also made worse because unlike many service stations in the area, because we are a smaller branch, we only have a single person working at any given time. It is very time consuming to drop hundreds into the safe and buy back notes to use as change. So some of my coworkers and I have slowly begun to deter these people through the following tactic. So a guy comes in at the head of a long line of customers. He orders a coffee for $4.75. He pulls out his wallet. I clearly see that he has a bunch of 10s and 20s, but he hands me a 100. This happens a lot. Sorry, but do you have anything smaller? I don't want to give you too much change. Don't say I never give people a chance. He gives me a grin. No, nope, that's all I have. So I smile and nod and proceed to count out 9625 in coins. All coins. Here in Australia, we have $2 coins and $1 coins, so I mainly use those, but I have to throw in a bunch of silvers too. His face goes pale as I'm counting it out. Just give it to me in notes, he says desperately. I'm sorry, sir, but all we have is coins today. I know because I personally deposited most of the notes and took a ton of coins from the safe. As I'm counting, I can see him calculating his options. He could, of course, admit he has other smaller notes, but there's a big group of people watching and it would be embarrassing as heck. But taking home $96.25 in coins would pull his pants around his ankles with their weight, no matter how tight he did his belt. Oh look, don't worry about it. Just give me my freaking money back. I don't even want the darn coffee. Are you sure? I say as pleasantly as possible. Yeah. I give him his money back and he leaves. By this time, half the customers in line are snickering at him. If there's no solution given to you, sometimes you just have to create your own. And you might need to be a little bit clever with it too. This one's brilliant because he's doing exactly what he still needs to do. Give change to the customer and he's putting it entirely in their hands. Sure, you can get change for the 100, but it's gonna cost you. Submit your story to be read on the channel at voiceyhearstories at gmail.com and join our Voicey Veteran community at r slash voiceyhear. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. All right, Voicey Veterans, I'll see you in the next one.